watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host Bahram Surush. Hello. And Fariwars Puya. Hello. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking on the issue of free expression. And obviously, free expression is not a luxury. It's something that's hugely crucial, particularly for people who are living under dictatorships and theocracies like Iran and Saudi Arabia. Let's listen to a clip about this issue and then we'll come back to discuss it further. Stay with us. Eight Iranians have been sentenced to harsh prison sentences from 7 to 20 years for insulting Khamenei and Islamic sanctities on Facebook. Amir Golestani has received 20 years, Masoud Qasem Khani 19 years and 91 days, Fariborz Kardar Far 18 years and 91 days, Sayyid Masoud Say Talebi 15 years and one day, Amin Akrami Poor, 13 years, and Mehti Re Shahri, 11 years. Two women, Naqme Shirazi, have received seven years and 91 days, whilst British Iranian national Roya Nobacht has been given 20 years merely for saying on Facebook that the regime is too Islamic. When you hear these sentences, you, I mean, you can say nothing but the fact that it's outrageous, you know, merely for the very fact of just saying something, something that people will take for granted in many parts of the world, writing it on Facebook, you are you're sentenced to 20 years in Iranian prisons, you know, and it, it just goes to show how important free expression is and also how regimes like the Iranian government uses things like insulting Khamenei or uh, Islamic sanctities as a way of suppressing speech and silencing criticism. I think 95% of people on Facebook today at, very mo at this very moment, if they were living under Islamic regime, uh, they would have been sentenced to exactly the same le length of sentences. Imagine that. I mean, that's the important thing. This is a regime that cannot a accept any criticism, and hence any expression of sort of uh, um, free thought is um, severely punished. I mean, th 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 this is how Iranian people have been living under this dictatorship and they've been fighting it. And that's so important that we be their voice and sort of expose the, uh, um, you, know, the, the you know, the whole nature of this government uh, that is trying to extend its uh, hands abroad as well and try to silence any criticism of Islam. And, and the reason is that this regime is af afraid of the truth. They don't want the truth to come out or to be expressed by people. Because if there were free expression in Iran and the people of Iran were free to choose the kind of government they want, none of these people would be in power. So in order to impose their power and their status, so they have to deny free expression to everyone. So uh, it's not that they are, they use the social media themselves, you know. They're not just, uh, it's not because they're technophobes. They are for, uh, it's not Western or anything in that sense. They accept all that. But they don't want the people to have access, free access to social media to express themselves. And they know that social media has become a powerful tool of organizing. That's why they're so afraid. And they want to intimidate the population by these outrageous sentences. I mean, the thing is that when you, when you look at this issue, very often the term offense and insult is used. And in a sense, when you look at it, I mean, I think many of the surahs and ayahs in the Quran are insulting to me as a woman, as a human being, as, you know, and to gay and lesbian people, to uh, children and to men uh, and to any living creature, you know. And in a sense, when, uh, when you look at this issue, the, you know, it's often used because what we, when we speak about people's rights, we speak about the right to express themselves, the right to have any belief that they want. There is no corresponding right that you can't be offended. And if you are offended, therefore you can either shut down discussions, which is what happens in, in Europe, in the West, or you can imprison people for 20 years merely for expressing their views. You know, the right to offend is very much part and parcel of having free expression and the right to express yourself. And it's quite key. I agree. Um, anything which is sacred usually hides a vested interest. Usually hides the powerful, you know, behind the powerful actually hide themselves behind the sacred. And in the in a religious government, you'll have that reinforced through state, and then the whole majority of the population are excluded 
from uh, expressing themselves by means of the sacred. And it's very important, crucial for a society to advance to question the sacred and undermine it and break the sacred. And, uh, you know, nothing really should be sacred. I know you've always said, except humanity, even I think, you know, th there should be no limit to uh, people questioning the sacred and undermining the sacred. And I think that's uh, such a powerful tool at the hands of, you know, individuals and humanity, especially these days. I think the whole idea of free speech is the tolerance and the ability to hear uh, dissenting ideas and views. Otherwise, if everybody, if everybody was uh, in agreement, there wouldn't be any need for discussion and for freedom to express different views. And um, part of that is that you are tolerant uh, to opposing ideas and you're not offended. But even if you are, it so is what? A, exactly. Yeah. So what? The, the offend. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And as you said, uh, um, the majority of the population seems to be able to be tolerant towards uh, offensive religious views, all sorts of ideologies, all, the, all sorts of political views. But when those in power, like the Iranian regime, um, uh, they want to restrict people's freedom and they say that we are offended. The point is that they have built an ideology which uh, is their ideology. It's not the ideology of the people by extension. They can't extend it to the rest, that religious ideology. First, that's the first premise. They s establish that. And then they say, we are offended if you are not Islamic enough. But, you know, hmm. the point is that you are Islamic. You have those, you know, views. A lot of them just rubbish, mm -hmm. you know. But the rest of us, we don't want to think like that. I, mean, I think there's, uh, there, there's two important points here as well. One is, um, Salman Rushdie said something very good, and he said, you know, if you're offended by a book, well, shut it. Nobody told you to read it. If you don't like what I'm saying and what I think, well, don't read it. But I have a right to express that view. And I think the other point is that that's very often, especially in the West, you see this conflation taking place, not in Iran, because there they'll just put you in prison for 20 years or execute you. But here, there's this sort of uh, idea that if you criticize a belief, then you're attacking people who have those beliefs or you're being racist or and so on and so forth. And it's clearly not the case. I think we should be intolerant of intolerable ideas. And that's part of free expression, to be able to challenge it, to be able to question it. That in no way means you're attacking people that hold those beliefs. And in fact, human progress throughout history, we've seen that a lot of it has to do with people challenging that which is taboo and sacred, as you mentioned, and challenging really deeply held sensibilities. And I think it's not just the religion, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sacredness. Uh, the powerful constantly reproduce the sacred. They always do. And nationalism, you know, sometimes, you know, that it becomes so important you can't, um, you know, question the flag of, of a state or, um, you know, a sense of sensibility of a community. Um, I think th these are the things that we need to be conscious of and always question and undermine the sacred. The sacred needs to be broken. I mean, that, that's the key in, um, for any progress in any society. And, and that's the, what you said, is that's, that's the key word is idea. You, know, the, you have to distinguish ideas. There's no limits to what you can say about ideas. And it, it is not synonymous with attacking certain group of population. Okay. So what you are doing, actually, you are saying that those ideas are, are uh, clashing with the real interests of the people. For example, you are saying when you make an anti-religious uh, criticism, you are saying religion is stopping progress. Religion is against human development and it shuts down so many doors and opportunities. And that is beneficial to the majority of the population. But that is just a tactic they use to... to uh, conflict situation, as, as, as you mentioned, to say that you are being uh, hostile to a certain group. Like, for example, they call you Islamophobe, whereas Islamophobe, in, in effect, is the fear of Islam, not a certain population group. It's the fear of Islam. And people have the right to be free, fearful of Islam and, and of Islamic uh, states and Islamic laws. Definitely. I mean, let's go to an interview we did earlier with Kate Smirthwaite. She's a comedian. And, uh, you know, she's a 
a large part of her life is spent poking fun at religion and making fun of you know those things that are considered sanctities i think she herself said that she'd most probably be in jail uh, for many of the things she said she, the fact that she's even on stage as a woman it could be illegal in many countries let's hear what she has to say and come back and maybe tell a few jokes that we know if we know any i doubt it well, stay with us Kate, welcome. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the cases which you most likely have heard of um, eight people in Iran who've been sentenced to seven mm -hmm. to twelve years, uh, amongst themselves to twenty years, some of them, for insulting Islam, insulting the Iranian regime. It's quite common, isn't it? Well, yeah, this is the thing is that I have heard about them and you know, what I haven't done is had that like, oh my goodness, because we just hear these stories all the time. It is only a few weeks since a woman in Sudan gave birth chained to a wall um, because she had married a Christian guy. Um, and that we've, Rafe Badawi is in prison facing uh, 10 years and a thousand lashes um, for criticizing the Saudi Arabian regime and, um, and, uh, and questioning uh, or, or saying things about Islam which they weren't happy about. And there are about 30 countries in the world where it's illegal to stop being a Muslim. And, and that, like that even, even if you are like an extremely devout religious person, that doesn't even make any sense because I don't think anyone believes that, you know, that if we die and we're waiting to get into heaven and, you know, Muhammad and Allah are there, that they're going to say, oh, I notice uh, that you're a Muslim. And you're going to say, yeah, well, I kind of had to be because it was the law. I mean, I don't necessarily really believe it, but I didn't say it out loud because I could have gone to prison. They're going to say, oh, great, come on in. That's just the kind of devout. I mean, everybody who really is religious believes that you have to choose religion and that people who choose it, you know, get, will go to heaven and the rest of us will all burn or whatever we're going to do. Um, is that what's so going to happen to you? Are you going to be burned? Well, there are a lot of people on the Internet <laughs> who like to let me know that that's, that's their opinion. Uh, of my future but it's funny isn't it because that's quite a sort of like, like on the one hand also every religious text would say don't judge other people you know don't just you know, live your life in a good and righteous way and yet bizarrely enough the first thing that so many people seem to do when they become religious is impose it on everybody around them and start judging people left right and center I mean it makes absolutely no sense it's true in the UK as well to some extent but but obviously not on the scale that it occurs in other parts of the world um, yeah, and especially places like Iran where, yeah, where it's illegal to stop being Muslim, which is illegal to believe something. But, I mean, either you believe things or you don't. I can tell you all day that there are magic fairies that live in my basement, but you're not going to believe me because, I mean, I'm looking at you. You obviously don't believe me, of course. Like, you'd be like, she's, she's gone a little bit crazy. So you can't force someone to believe something. That, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, the more you have to force them, the more I think, well, it's obviously not true. Why have you got to... Why have you got to keep telling me that? I mean, in a sense, doesn't it sometimes make you think about the fact that there are people who are getting maybe 20 years for saying and doing things that you actually do for a living? You make mm -hmm. fun of religion and people's very sacred beliefs, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so I make a living as a stand-up comic and one of the main subjects I talk about on stage is organised religion of all kinds. And yeah, um, and so these, uh, there are dozens of things that I say on stage um, that would get me sent to prison in parts of the world and the way I dress on stage would get me sent to prison in parts of the world and the fact that I get on stage would get me sent to prison in certain parts of the world. Um, yeah, which I think actually is all the more reason why we should do it. Like, all the more reason why we should say these things because we can. Like, like we fight so hard for these freedoms and it's a, it's a real waste then not to use them and actually to use them to point out the ridiculousness. Um, you know, they don't have to pass a law banning people from saying that, you know, the sky is yellow or the grass is purple because, you know, people, we don't worry when people say these things. We just go, oh, maybe you're colorblind. Um, so if you really believe these things so firmly and if your belief is really so unshakable, why are you so scared of somebody challenging it? Do you sometimes worry about offending people on, on stage? No, I really don't worry about offending people. Um, I don't set out to offend anybody. Um, I, I'm sure I have, I know I have, people have walked out. Um, what I would never do is criticise somebody because of their 
ethnicity or their sexuality or their gender or you know their medical circumstances their disability uh, whether they were transsexual like anything like this I would never criticize anybody for making any of those you know for being in any of those groups but religion is quite different religion is something that you think about and you believe and you figure out um, I think it's very foolish to go through life accepting what somebody else says about something as important as like the whole meaning of life um, we get at least according to my uh, beliefs or views um, we get one go at this life and to spend it following a bunch of rules that don't make any sense and are enormously restrictive based on an imaginary deity I mean that's that's a complete waste of the one life that we do get which you could spend doing all kinds of fulfilling and amazing things so I think it's really important to challenge these things and it's also especially important because in lots of parts of the world people don't have access to good quality education and so they might have been raised and never heard these things challenged and we all go through our lives without hearing things challenged and I, so I think it's really important to, to challenge things when we get the chance and to have that heard um, and oh, I will drag, your interview will drag on forever but um, I watched an amazing documentary about child marriage in the third world and there was this young girl who had been rescued from being married off when she was eight or nine years old and she was talking about how happy she was to have escaped that circumstance and how she was really looking forward to getting married when she was 16. And like, there's me thinking, how can you see that eight is a rubbish time to get married, but you can't see that 16? Still, you know, there's so much more you could do with your life. And then at the same time, like, you know, I did get married when I was like 32. And I think probably there's somebody out there going, don't do it, don't do it. Like, you don't have to do that. And this woman, you know, in the video, she was wearing the whole headscarf and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, how can you understand that that part of the rules you're being given is a nonsense and it's better for you to have the freedom not to do that but you're still following all these other things and yet there are lots of rules that I think we all still follow even in the UK that actually we could do with a wake-up call once in a while that goes is that really so great is that such a good idea I mean do you think comedy is a really good way of actually challenging these sort of concepts yeah I think I think, well, I mean, and it's actually been scientifically proven. Uh, there was a piece of research in the US that says that um, jokes have a bigger influence on people's opinions than facts or statements. Mm -hmm. So they've actually done the research. So, you know, these regimes that are so afraid of comedians, in a way they're right. In a way they're right because having somebody stand there and say, I don't think this is true, um, is actually much less powerful than somebody saying, no, sure it's true. Yeah, of course it's true. There's definitely a magic guy on a cloud. Yeah, you're definitely right. That's a much more dangerous thing to say. So what are some of the jokes you, you, you do say to your audiences, uh, particularly with regards to religion? Since we're talking about offence and mm -hmm. offending people's religious sense of it, yeah. it's a good time for you to, to say something. I feel like I'm on a challenge now. Like if, I can't, like if, if in the next 30 seconds you don't march out of the room going, what? Uh, I've like let the side down. But, um, but I say all sorts of things about religion. One thing I do is I go a lot on a TV show that we have in the UK called The Big Questions, uh, where we debate about religion. Look, the big questions they're supposed to ask. And for some reason, the big questions are always about religion. And I always say, like, in my world, there's only really one big question about religion. And the answer is no. <laughs> like, I could finish that show at five past ten. I could be like, home time. Let's ask some really big questions. And I also talk about, a lot of people say to me, like, you know, if you're not sure about religion, wouldn't it be safer just to just to be religious? Um, and, you know, and then if you're right afterwards, you know, you're going to get the benefits or whatever. But actually, the reality is that being religious is not a ticket to heaven. It's a lottery ticket to heaven because almost every religion believes that all the others are wrong. <laughs> so if, if one religion is true after we die, we're all going to be in this big queue. And the guy at the front's like, oh, I'm definitely going to win. I'm definitely getting in. Who have you got? Who have you got? I've got Zeus, uh, the king of the Greek gods. And we're like, oh, but the thing is, because he was supposed to live on Mount Olympus, and about a thousand years later, we climbed it. <laughs> it was, He's not there. Yeah. <laughs> and who have you got? Oh, I've got Amaterasu, the Japanese sun goddess. And that's nice, because it's always nice to put women in a competition, but just don't let them win. Um, <laughs> I find that with the comedy world. And uh, yeah, and then there's one really happy guy. He's got David Icke. Um, and you, David Icke, is, he's an English guy who... Um, who used to be a television presenter and then suddenly decided to wear a purple tracksuit and say that he was the son of God. And uh, I think he's a long shot, but you know, who knows, maybe he is the one true God. Um, and, and if I go even further, and this is where I might even dig myself, I know this is right into the realm of where people have walked out of my shows. 
Um, if there is one true God, one thing we can say about him for sure is that he's a racist. Um, because if you tell me somebody's ethnicity, I can, with 90% accuracy, guess their religion. So if there is one true God and only one of these groups of people are going to go to heaven, I mean, if I had been born in Japan, the chances of me growing up Christian would be very, very low. If I had been born in, you know, Russia, the likelihood of me being a Muslim, if I'd been born in South America, the likelihood of me being any religion is very, very governed by that. So if there is one God and he's revealed himself only to this one group of people who are all the same ethnicity, well, there's a word for that, isn't there? And it's racist. Um, and, I mean, also quite clearly sexist and homophobic because of all those rules about who you're allowed to have sex with and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. One last question. I mean, yeah. Do you think that offence is actually an important aspect of comedy and causing offence, in a sense, of comedy and even bringing change, bringing about change? Well, I think that comedy, like now, to go into comedy theory, comedy is what we would call transgressive. So. Like, there's something funny about breaking the rules. That's what's fun about, like I always say, you know, the, the essence of, the most purest essence of what a, a joke is, is when people are expecting you to say something that is completely different from what you actually cunt. Um, <laughs> do you see what I mean? Like, it's just because you break that rule and you say the completely unexpected, the thing that you're not allowed to say, the worst possible thing, um, that's, that's where comedy comes. It's the thing you weren't expecting to hear. And so, that's, so, so firstly, that's what's funny. And as such, comedy becomes a brilliant weapon for breaking rules and testing rules and, and, and crossing boundaries, yeah. Great, thank you. Cool. I hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Kate Smirthwaite. I know Reza and I did when we went to, to see her. I mean, the thing is that, you know, we talk about these horrendous sentences of people in Iran and, you know, it is a source of outrage and I think people everywhere should be condemning the, these sentences. On the other hand, it also shows the huge amounts of criticism that religion is facing to the point where the regime is so angered by it that it sentences someone to 20 years for, for it. You know, it's trying to control things, it's lost control. I mean, I think the reality is that you're not going to find more jokes against Islam and the Islamic regime in a place other than places like Iran. They're, yeah. they're more than anywhere else. If you just search, make a quick search, you'll yeah. see <laughs> thousands of jokes against, you know, making fun of these mullahs because the interesting thing about Islam and this particular government is that it provides you so much, so much, uh, it's a treasure trove of material for stand-up comedians. Sure. You know, I'm sure Kurt, if, if Kate could uh, read Farsi, <laughs> she would find a lot of material for another 20 years, you know, to tell jokes about. And a lot of religions are like that because it, it is, imagine, it's an idea which even at 1500 years ago was outdated to be to stay frozen and to be used in 21st century of course people will find find it funny you know it's only that when you look at the flip side that a lot of people you know the victims you know it's become tragic so it's a tragic comic situation that we are faced with but the uh, in iran the interesting thing is that the, you will find especially the young generation i think iran is, has one of the highest bloggers in the world if not the highest so the facebook uh, blogs are being used to tell these jokes but uh, of course at risk to themselves but I think it's a losing game for the regime. I think uh, and the, I mean these sentences that you uh, we read, read out earlier regarding the uh, people who've been sentenced to uh, long sentences um, shows that the uh, Islamic regime wants to intimidate people but they can't they can't you know the whole you know majority of the uh, population in Iran are under 25 and these have access to uh, Facebook irrespective of the, all the controls and that uh, Iranian government imposes all the uh, restrictions put on the internet they have means and methods of accessing um, uh, Facebook, internet, um, Twitter and they are the ones who actually 
bringing in this regime to its knees. So there's, two, there's a contrast between the repressive regime who is trying to intimidate, intimidate the society and a huge uh, mass of population who haven't accepted this I mean, Kay, and on a daily basis questioning the Islamic regime. Kay talks about how comedy is so transgressive and it's such a good way of challenging and in a sense that's why you have so many jokes sprouting up. Part of it is, as you say, it's the reality of the regime. You just hear things that they say and do, uh, you know, and it's it's uh, la laughable. Like there, there was uh, one real story of a uh, MP, and the MPs are all mullahs in Iran, who was trying to catch a cab to get to the parliament, the Islamic Assembly. And uh, he couldn't get a cab because no cab will stop for them. And so he, he turned up late to Parliament and when they asked him what had happened, he said, well, I had to go and change into normal clothes because no one would stop for me. You know, and this is not a joke, it's reality. Yeah. But we've got a couple of jokes because there's um, Janati, who's the um, head of the Guardian of Councils, which is the body that, you know, oversees all the misogyny and, you know, they're... Their, inhuman laws. Uh, he's really old and he just won't die. Um, you know, if there's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. So there's a couple of jokes that Pune Ravi actually found out for us. One was, you know, they had said um, the, the doctors have uh, lost all hope for Janati and they said that he will never die, you know, <laughs> and then there's another one which says there you, is... Maria, are you sure you want to continue with this? <laughs> no, there's just one part I've got to say which I'll, is I'll really funny. <laughs> There's one that's really funny, which is the um, the date of the discovery of the hijab was when Adam told Eve, you know, go, my for, for goodness sakes, go and cover yourself. You know, this Janati is such a pervert. You know, <laughs> so that's when yeah. you know a veiling started, yeah. sort I of mean, thing. I mean, Janati seems to be around f forever. Yeah. You know, that, that's why the reason I understand why you're saying that. And there are lots of jokes about him. Um, and uh, because and when even the, at the sermons, you know, Friday sermons, yes, or yeah. when they speak, there are positive, pop you know, even those people who have come there, actually, they, they may be the handpicked supporters, but even they start laughing because a lot of times <laughs> what they are saying is, um, I mean, if you, for example, if Khomeini's book, oh, yeah, yeah? Yeah. yeah, if that is translated into English, I'm sure it is not, you know, if that's translated, there's so much uh, material in there, you know, about, about sex with animals, the details of your sexual behavior, how you go to the bathroom and everything. So you don't believe yourself that what you're reading is, has been written down by someone. That, so um, people in Iran making a joke against that, it's a part, partly it's also it's a let's, uh, to let off steam as well, you know. Part of the resistance that is going on in Iran, which has taken a comic, a joking way of uh, make, poking fun of that. And if you take that away f that from the population, you know, that would be a very sad effect. And, and it's quite, I think, uh, um, comedy and um, um, poking fun and jokes, I think it's quite serious. I think it shows the psychology of the society while somehow, uh, um, you know, allows people to continue to live under really hard circumstances. But at the same time, you could see the critical points the unconscious critical points in society that questions the fundamentals and yet is not accepting. And I think that's part and parcel of Iranian society and is growing under the Islamic regime. I mean, I think, I, w I wonder what you think about, uh, you know, comedy as a way of relief, poking fun of religion, uh, what you, you think about it. I mean, obviously we have to remember that these have serious consequences for a lot of people. But on the other hand, it is a way, it, it is a direct challenge, you know, to theocracy and the Islamic regime. It's an important challenge and one I think that Iranians have shown time and time again that uh, the, the extreme bravery and courage to be able to do that under the most difficult conditions and push the regime to such a corner that it, um, it you know, has to give such sentences. Um, send us your jokes. Actually post any of your jokes on our Facebook page and we'll try to repeat them, uh, but I won't do it because I'm not very good at delivery. Uh, but neither are they. We'll get Reza Moradi. <laughs> he's fantastic. And he knows all of Khomeini's, uh, uh, you know, the book by heart about what happens if you fall off a floor and <laughs> go into another floor. The, the roof caves in and you land on your aunt and you have sex by yeah, accident. And she becomes pregnant. And she becomes yeah. pregnant. What's going to happen? <laughs> so keep, keep posted. We'll have him do a comedy skit for you guys. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed this week's program. Until next week, have a wonderful week and we'll see you then hopefully. Goodbye.